OK, so um, this time I'll be talking about pre-trained uh, word representations. Um, and uh, you know, as we've been talking about neural models, um, I'm going to give a quick reminder about the kinds of operations we do in neural models. Um, and this time I'm going to be talking mainly about pre-trained word representations. Next time I'm going to be talking about pre-trained contextualized and sentence representations. So the way a neural model looks is we have essentially an embedding function um, where we take an input and we uh, measure every uh, vector, or, and we get a vector for each word. And um, you know, if we do uh, some sort of word level prediction task, uh, we might be wanting to predict the next word, which would be a language modeling task, or a part of speech tagging uh, task for each word, named entity recognition, et cetera. Um, and then we might take these embeddings and further embed uh, to get a sentence embedding, one embedding for each sentence or each you know, span or something like this. And then from this, uh, we'll want to do sentence level uh, you know, embedding or prediction. So um, then the question becomes, how do we train embeddings? And up until this point, we've been talking about initializing randomly and training jointly with the task. Um, but you can also do things like pre-training and, um, uh, and then using the pre-trained embeddings for another task. And so this uh, could include pre-training on a supervised task like part of speech tagging or parsing, um, or pre-training on an unsupervised task uh, like language modeling. Um, and out of all of these, and when I say language modeling, I'm talking about language modeling here in a very loose sense. So up until now, I've been talking about language modeling in this kind of stricter sense, which is calculating a probability distribution, um, P of X over sentences. So I think the, like a standard language model, this is the language model's job. It tries to calculate a probability distribution over sentences where you can be doing uh, sampling or something like this. Um, but a lot of the objectives I'm going to be talking about this time are not actually able to calculate probabilities of sentences, but they're trained only on, on textual data. So uh, that's why I'm calling them uh, quote unquote unsupervised. Um, there's a little bit of confusion about like unsupervised versus supervised versus self-supervised, or uh, there's all this terminology. Um, from my point of view, which not everybody would agree with, um, the um, basically unsupervised means you don't you aren't given um, any labels for solving uh, the task itself. Um, and so you can solve a supervised task, but you're still doing unsupervised learning of the representations that are used in the solving of the task. So like essentially, um, you have supervision for the outgoing labels, but you don't have any supervision for the actual underlying embeddings, right? So nobody ever told you what the underlying embedding should look like. So it's actually a little bit complicated. You could even, if you think about language modeling, you could even think of it as a supervised task because you're given the thing you're trying to model, right? You're given the text. So um, the terminology is a little bit confusing here, um, and it's not very consistent. So uh, that's what the world we live in. Um, <laughs> there's not much we can do about it. Um, so uh, first, uh, this time I'm going to talk mainly about non-contextualized word representations. And what do we mean by this? Or sorry, for, first, what do we want to know about words? Um, and the answer is uh, a lot of things. Like for uh, engineering purposes, we might want to know if they're the same part of speech. So we might want to know about their syntactic uh, features. Um, we might want to know if they have the same conjugation. So this would be something like morphological features. Um, uh, do the words mean basically the same thing? Are they synonyms? So this would be more semantic. Um, or do they have some semantic relation? So like, are they in an is-a uh, relation? So like Graham Newbig is a uh, uh, professor. Uh, Graham Newbig is uh, American or something like that, um, uh, et cetera. So basically, word embeddings, we would like them to capture both syntax and semantics, right? Not necessarily, um, not necessarily both. Uh, not necessarily either or. So calling word embedding spaces semantic spaces is also kind of a misnomer, right? They're actually like 
syntacto semantic spaces or something like this, or just spaces that have a lot of information in them. Um, so um, we're going to talk about two types of representations, so um, non-contextualized representations and contextualized representations. And basically, the, the difference between a non-contextualized representation and a contextualized representation is that non-contextualized representations, you calculate one each vector independently. You don't uh, consider any of the other vectors in the sentence. Whereas contextualized representations, you look at the whole sentence and you calculate a vector for each word. Um, but the vector for each word might change depending on what the other words in the sentence. And as I said, we're going to mainly cover the first today. So um, before going into uh, word embeddings, I'd like to talk a little bit about a manual attempt uh, to uh, create you know, information about words, uh, WordNet. So I like asking this every year. Um, how many people have used WordNet in your research? OK, still going pretty strong, actually. So <laughs> the percentage of people goes down every year. Um, but, uh, but still, we had a good 30% or something like that. Um, but WordNet, what WordNet is, in case you're one of the people who hasn't used it before, it's, it's basically a large database of words, including parts of speech, semantic relations, et cetera. Um, and so basically, at the very top, you have the most general semantic class, artifact. Uh, then you have motor vehicle, then you have motor car, uh, you have hatchback, compact, gas guzzler. Um, under motor vehicle, that's not a motor car, you have like go-karts and trucks, etc. cetera. So, um, this is a big network of basically is a uh, relations between, uh, between words. Um, notably, this was a major effort to develop, and there are resources available in many languages in the world. And every time you wanted to create one for a new language, you would have to do uh, extra work. Um, but it's a, a really major effort. And unfortunately, if you go to the, uh, the WordNet site, or when you went to the WordNet site a year ago, I haven't checked it this year. It said, unfortunately, we can't take any more requests for improving WordNet because we don't have money to do so. Um, so this is like a real, it's a real problem, obviously. You don't, um, you don't have experts. You can't hire experts to uh, continue to maintain your resource, and that's going to um, you know, become out of date or obsolete. Uh, so the question is, can we do something similar, uh, more complete, and without the effort? And uh, the answer. It uh, could be word embeddings, so a continuous vector representation of words. Um, within the word embeddings, uh, features of syntax and semantics may be included. Um, and for example, you know, element number one might be more positive for nouns, so that would be a syntactic feature. Element number two might be more positive for animate objects. Animate objects need to be a noun, so that's a little bit of syntax, but that's also a bit of semantics, right? Um, Element number three might have no intuitive meaning whatsoever. Maybe it somehow correlates with um, you know, some spelling feature of the model. Maybe it was just not learned very well. Uh, who knows? So um, word embeddings are cool. This is an obligatory slide that I assume almost everybody in this room has seen already. But uh, this, yeah, <laughs> you know this. Um, so this is uh, the thing from the first, uh, like, paper on word to vec uh, by Mikulov et al. in 2013. And the basic idea is because these word embeddings kind of have a linear relationship in the space in some way, um, you can have king and queen. And then you can add a similar direction vector uh, from king to kings and queen to queens. And um, uh, the direction between king and kings uh, and queen and queens will be similar. Um, so this is basically um, a syntactic direction, right? You're going from a word to its plural. Um, if you look at the blue thing, this is more of a semantic direction, right? You're going from a male-gendered uh, uh, word to a female-gendered word. Um, so this is kind of interesting already because WordNet doesn't have any information about what is the female equivalent of king. Uh, for example. So already um, by you know, calculating these vectors and moving in, in directions, you're capturing more information than was able to be captured by this large lexical resource. Has anyone explicitly studied what's captured or not captured by word embeddings compared to say something like WordNet? Has anyone explicitly studied what is captured or not captured according to word embeddings and, uh, compared to WordNet? Yeah. 
And the answer is basically um, yes. And there's also been some work that I'm going to talk about later on methods that combine the two together. Uh, so like do better word in, uh, learning of word embeddings using information in word uh, and, uh I don't know if I'm going to talk about the opposite, which is automatically extracting something like WordNet from word embeddings, but there's a lot of research on that, and I think we're going to cover that in later lectures. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about the previous slides. What is the meaning of the task syntactic parsing? What is the meaning of the task syntactic parsing? Um, we're going to talk about that later, um, later in the class, but it's basically um, discovering the underlying syntax of sentences according to some uh, definition of what syntax looks like. And some very common examples, <coughs> I think I have a very common example of dependency syntax. It's like the uh, boy uh, ate lunch. And you have a subject, uh, sorry, object. And subject. And determiner. And you try to predict uh, these things. I've seen this. This is only syntactic parsing. This is uh, one variety of syntactic parsing, yeah. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, so there was a quick mention in the, um, in the reading about distributional and distributed uh, representations. Um, I'd like to make it a little bit more explicit uh, than was in the reading. And basically, um, distributional representations um, are based on the assumption that words are similar if they appear in similar contexts. Um, so the distribution of words is indicative of usage. And in contrast, you could think of a non-distributional representation. And uh, this could, for example, be created by a dictionary or a lexical resource like WordNet. So you have no, um, no information about the distribution of words in actual text, but um, uh, it's a representation of the word nonetheless. Distributed representations are basically something that's represented by a vector of values, um, each representing activations. Usually this is a dense vector. Um, so you know all of the all of the elements in the vector are real values, uh, not uh, usually not equal to zero. Um, in contrast, local representations um, are uh, where each thing is represented by a discrete symbol, so a one-hot vector. And actually, one of the big gains that we have gotten uh, by using neural networks is moving from uh, these local representations, one-hot feature vectors, to uh, these distributed representations. Um, so yeah, actually, I'll go into that a little bit more. So. An interesting thing about this is what, what do you think a cluster ID is? So like let's say we have uh, we have word to vec vectors and then we cluster together um, we cluster together uh, words based on their similarity in the space. So what is a cluster ID? Is it a distributed representation or a local representation? Anybody? So who thinks distributed? Who thinks local? OK, yeah, you're right. So it's a local representation because the cluster ID is an ID, right? Just like a word ID is. So um, every once in a while, people come to me and say, uh, you know, like, I'd like to incorporate clustering in my model uh, where I take the neural representations and then I cluster them together and do something. And actually, one of the questions I always ask then is why? You know, like distributed representations are more, you know, they allow you to express more things without actually segmenting the space and give you a richer view of things. So um, it's kind of interesting, like what is the, uh, what is the, I'm trying not to say meaning, but like what, what, is, what is the role of uh, something like clustering when we have uh, distributed representations? And honestly, I don't have a really good answer for that other than like efficiency purposes, for example. Um, so, now given that, um, I'd like to go back to distribu distributional representations. And distributional representations are based on the fact that words appear in context. Um, I have a kind of interesting thing uh, in the code uh, examples. So I think this is uh, code example number three. 
um, called kwic.py. It's a really simple Python program like this that allows you to um, basically view words in their context. So you write a word and then your corpus, and then it will output, um, it will output something that looks like this. Um, who knows what kwic stands for? Anybody? Keyword in context. Keyword in context, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I, I didn't see very many hands. This is also something I ask people every time, and it very highly correlates with anybody who's taken a linguistics class, um, because keyword in context is, uh, is from a, like, is widely, widely used in linguistics. It's also called a concordancer. That's another name uh, that you might have heard if you've taken a linguistics class. But, um, uh, but anyway, so like, the interesting thing here is this is something that linguists do. Uh, when they want to learn more about a language or something like that. They take words, they look at the context that they appear in, and then they use that to understand uh, the meaning of the word or the syntax of the word or something better. And essentially our distributional representations are doing exactly the same thing. They're looking at the context and they're learning about the word and how it relates to other words that appear in similar contexts. So if you look at like Pittsburgh and Cleveland, um, I was kind of hoping these would be more similar than I actually got, but we have like, uh, University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, <coughs> Pittsburgh branch of the committee, uh, Pittsburgh firm, Pittsburgh firm, Cleveland bank, Cleveland merchant. So you can kind of see that, uh, um, that things appear in, in similar contexts, except there's no University of Cleveland uh, appearing in the Wall Street Journal, I guess. Uh, okay. So uh, we talked about count-based methods and the reading a little bit. So basically these work by creating a word context count matrix. You count the number of co-occurrences between a word and a context with rows as words, columns as contexts. Um, maybe you weight it with something like pointwise mutual information between them. Uh, maybe you reduce the dimensions using something like singular value uh, decomposition. Um, and then you can measure their close lists using something like cosine similarity or Jacquard similarity or others. Um, so I'm not really going to cover these. And the reason why I'm not really going to cover these is because uh, this is neural networks for NLP class, and this is not a neural network. But um, uh, these are something that were used uh, very widely. And uh, uh, Glo Glove or Glove, I actually don't know the, the correct way to pronounce this, is very highly motivated by this using methods that are kind of similar to, uh, uh, to neural network-based optimization methods. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. So. Um, on the other hand, prediction-based methods try to predict the word uh, within a neural network. And essentially, word embeddings are the byproduct of this prediction. Um, so like one way you could do this is get word embeddings from language models. So like as I, as I said, uh, language models themselves could be used to learn word embeddings. Um, so there's a couple places you could grab the word embeddings from. One is from these lookup matrices here. Um, the other one is from this softmax uh, matrix. Uh, matrix here. And either one of these, like I mentioned before, um, both of these have one vector for each word in the vocabulary. So either one of these could be a candidate for the place where you can get uh, embeddings from. Um, and actually, the first embeddings uh, created by like Yashio Bengio or uh, Turian et al. and others just use these language models and already proved that they worked pretty well. Um, however, uh, more recently, Context window based methods are more popular. So, um, if we don't need to calculate the probability of the sentence, so basically, if we give up on having our model be an actual language model, uh, we're then you know, free to design any prediction problem we want as long as it has some matrix that has uh, the size of the vocabulary is one dimension and the, um, and the width of the word embeddings is another dimension. Um, so this moves closer to the context used in count-based methods um, and drives word to vec, et cetera. And to give a few examples of these, the first one, the SIBO, is um, predicting the word based on the sum of the surrounding embeddings. So you look up the words, add them together. And uh, you take this as basically your predictor. And um, you multiply this by um, uh, the embeddings for the words themselves. And you calculate scores. So um, basically, this is a language model. Um, it's like a language model, except a language model um, would be using the previous two um, 
would be using the previous two words instead of the previous two and the next two words. And also, it would, might be looking up different words for the two previous and the one previous, right? So we talked about um, like a continuous bag of words model on the first day of class. Um, this is a continuous bag of words model, um, but, it, um, but it's using uh, the, instead of using like the previous two to do a language model prediction, it's using the previous two and the next two or whatever. Um, this might be a little bit different than the way you normally think about word to vec if you've heard about word to vec before. So normally the way word to vec is formulated is you have um, the vector for the word and the vector for the context. And you take the dot product of the two um, and then use this as a score. I'm intentionally not talking, not expressing it this way and rather expressing it as a prediction problem because the dot product is equivalent to one row of a matrix multiplication, right? So um, this is equivalent to one row of the matrix multiplication. So this is just taking the dot product over all the vocabulary items and calculating the scores for them. Um, so by doing this, you can move the C, uh, the CBO uh, closer to what we know from language modeling. Um, and if we took a softmax over them, um, we could calculate probabilities, for example. Um, in reality, this is not exactly what word to vec is doing. word to vec is also doing negative sampling, like we talked about in uh, West class, two classes ago? Two classes ago, or several classes ago. Um, so uh, we, uh, it's doing negative sampling, which means instead of calculating the full softmax, you calculate only a subset of them. Um, and it's not actually using a probabilistic loss function. It's using a, a hinge-based loss function. But still, it's pretty, uh, the um, contrastive loss function. So it's, but it's still pretty uh, similar, I guess. Um, so I have an example implementation of this, if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, I, I mentioned that if you want to take a look at these implementations and do something with them, I, I'll try to provide something for this. Um, one thing that you could do with this is this is not currently using negative sampling, but you could convert it to try to uh, use negative sampling. So that would be one thing you could try. Yeah. Um, does this not differentiate the context before and after? Separate so does SIBO not differentiate the context before and after? And the answer is uh, it, you are correct in saying that it does not. So it, there's no differentiation between the context before and after. Um, you could think of doing that, but what, uh, what would happen if you did that is you'd essentially double your context parameters. You'd double the number of context vectors that you would have to have. So I think that's why people don't do that. Yeah? Just kind of want to make sure that uh, are the parameters, so what are the cannibal parameters here? Is what? it only the Ws here? Um, it's also these, uh, these vectors here that you're looking up. So you basically have two parameter matrices. You have um, one where this is the size of the vocabulary, and this is the size of the, the vector itself, the hidden states. And you have another one where this is the size of the vocabulary, and this is the size of the hidden states. Where this one is this W here, and this is the one for the actual words in the middle of the context. And then the lookup parameters are also a similar thing, um, are also a similar matrix. So as I mentioned, in one of the very early classes, when I say lookup, um, this could also be um, equivalent to uh, basically multiplying this by a one-hot uh, vector and selecting just a single row of this matrix. So like, let's say you wanted to get uh, giving and uh, up. All of these would be one row in this big matrix here. So the gray lookup is this. In the red W is, is this over here. Okay. Uh, I guess I got the gray thing, but what the W is doing? So the w, the w is being multiplied by the context uh, to get scores for each word, essentially. Like, um, semantically, what it's doing it is it, 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 it is it converting the context to the probability of a given word or it's taking the context and the vector and calculating how, uh, it's taking this sum of the context vectors and the, um, and the vector for each word 
and seeing how similar they are. So basically, the more similar the vector for the actual word, like let's say the actual word is talk, is with the vector that you calculate from the context, the higher its score will be, because the higher its dot product, um, uh, the dot product between the two vectors will be. And basically, you want that score to be higher than the score for like some other thing, like that is not talk. So like giving a, um, giving a exploded at the, should, should have a very low score there. Yeah? You might have told this before, but can you give an example of the source of lookup? Can I give an example of the, the source? Of lookup, like what, where are you looking it up from? Where are you looking it up from? You're looking it up by basically <coughs> selecting a row in this big matrix of parameters. Where's that coming from? How do you initialize it? Because oh, how do you initialize the parameters? So, like, um, like in any neural network, you need to initialize the parameters somehow, and usually they're initialized randomly um, uh, within some range. So you don't already have a good vector for giving it, right? Because that's the goal of the task. That's what right, exactly. Doing. So you, you start, this task will almost always start random, basically. Yeah. So you start out with nothing, and then you train this task on plain text. And then after you've created this task on plain text, you then apply it to a new task. But you assume that what you've learned on plain text uh, will generalize to other tasks. Um, I'll go here first. Um, how do we calculate loss for the probability? So uh, we have, say, one positive word that we know mm -hmm. in plain text, and we have k negative sample. Yep. Um, so mm, now, would we just consider these probabilities, like one zero zero, or what would be the other values as, as like, when we're calculating the cost? So, so how do you calculate the loss? So um, it depends on what method you're using. So like word to vec uses a kind of strange negative sampling uh, style loss that I talked about a few classes ago. But what about the other words, like which are either in the negative sample or in a positive which positive would just be one, and I only have say k negative ones. So, so basically you're training the model to increase the probability of the um, so like, let's, let's take the simple case first. Let's take the simple case where we're not doing negative sampling. Here, it would just be a one-hot vector on top, and all the other ones would be wrong. What would be zero? So you just maximize the probability of uh, top. Yeah. So uh, isn't that using a soft max, and we have one on dog. Say there's a index called cube dog, and like, there's another one called cube cat. Do you think it's actually good probability to be a cube dog or a cube cat? But if you have this soft max, and I try to optimize one particular thing like dog, it would penalize other values. Okay. So this is this is a good question. So here we are predicting talk. So this, this goes for regular language models as well, right? So like let's say you have an identical context and it's like um, the you have your first word, the first word in the sentence is the, then the second word is any noun, right? You know, it, it could be any noun. So it's not uniquely defined which one you should be using. Um, however, the answer is, for this particular training example that you're looking at right now, you have one answer that's actually correct. So you just optimize the probability of that answer. Now why, now why is that a good idea? So like, you, you know the talk um, is the thing you saw this time, but you know you're gonna see the cat, the person, whatever. But the problem comes in when we're saying that we're using softmax because, like, the whole idea is that we're trying to, like, not the initial idea when we came from some point softmax is like we don't just want to ensure that we're taking one value to one, but also presuming that others go to zero. Yeah. So, so maybe you can let me finish uh, with what I was about to say. But like, so it's not the case that the talk is going to be right all the time, right? So what you do, what you're doing is instead of saying. I've seen the, um, I, I've seen the, uh, and I want to predict the next word. Um, so what, what is our next word uh, after the? Um, I'll, I'll just call it W. Um, and in the current example, uh, you're going to take the log probability, um, you're going to take the log probability with respect to um, cat. But in the next example in the corpus, you're going to be taking the log probability with respect to you know, dog or something else. 
So it might seem wrong that you're trying to force the softmax to upweigh cat this time, but in reality, you're doing this over the entire corpus. And if you sum up all the losses over the entire corpus, the ideal answer for the softmax is not going to be to give one to any particular word, but rather to actually match the true probability distribution over the entire corpus. And if you're doing full gradient descent, not stochastic gradient descent, but where you accumulate the gradient over the entire corpus, then actually it will, you know, um, the, all the gradients will push in different directions and you'll get, you know, something that tries to flatten out the softmax to the true distribution. If you're doing stochastic gradient descent, you're getting a noisy approximation of that. So, like, maybe one time you'll move towards cap and the next time you'll move towards dog. But overall, on average, you're going to get to a place where it kind of smooths out the probability distribution to match what you actually expect. So, um, that's the case in regular language models. It's also the case in word vector. Does that kind of Okay. Yeah. yeah. So one question is, when you're training, we have like two separate matrices for one for the word and one for the context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone tried to analyze how similar the word and the context are? Is it not possible that we use the same matrix for the word as well as for the context? So um, this is a very good question. So has anybody tried to analyze how similar the representations we learn in the context and the representations we learn in the words are? Um, and the answer is, Yes, I have read such analyses, but it was a long time ago, so I don't remember very well. Um, but uh, you definitely need to use different matrices when you're using a, a really, really simple model like this. When you're using a more complicated model that runs through multiple layers of neural networks or has some sort of uh, bilinear function in it or something like that, then it's okay for, to share the parameters. But in this simple dot product model, uh, the way contexts behave and the way words behave is actually quite different, so you definitely need to separate them. Now, the uh, next question is, so which one do you want to use? This results in two matrices, right? Um, and the answer is, uh, I think, um, in general, the word one, uh, I've... Actually, I, I, won't, I won't say this with very much confidence. I think the result was that the word one was better most of the time, but um, I, I am not 100% confident in this because it's been a long time since I've read this paper. So. Yeah. Um, good question, so any other questions? OK, I'll move on. Um, so uh, there's also the skip gram model. Um, so in the skip gram model, you're doing um, the uh, you're doing the opposite. So basically, you look up the uh, the word itself, and then you try to predict um, the uh, the words that appear in the context. So this is a little bit less intuitive. It's like a strange language modeling task where you have context, which is um, a single word, and then you want to predict any one of the words around it. Um, and uh, there's been some analysis about like which one should be using, which one is better, but like honestly, my impression here is they're kind of pretty similar, um, and uh, it is much much more important to decide which context you want to be using uh, than decide uh, like which objective function you want to be using to optimize that. So, um, if anyone else has any other experience, then I'd be interested. So um, count-based and uh, prediction-based methods. So there's a really interesting result by uh, Amir Levy and uh, Jörg Goldberg that basically uh, analyzes the skip gram objective and uh, finds that the skip gram objective is equal to matrix factorization um, with uh, pointwise mutual information and it is discount uh, for the number of samples k. So um, it's like a regularizer based on the number of negative samples you have. Um, I think this is really interesting because, you know, ostensibly word -to -vec was a huge revolution in the field, right? Um, but actually it's <laughs> exactly the same objective as a, uh, um, uh, you know, as things people were using before with, you know, a few minor modifications. I think the reason why it actually made a huge difference here is um, the way it, it is optimized more than anything else. And because word to vec is optimized um, using stochastic gradient descent, 
um, you can train it over a huge data set, just keep it running, uh, train it in parallel, et cetera. So you could scale it up much larger than many of the matrix factorization methods that people use. So I think, if anything, probably scale was a bigger, uh, scale and speed was a bigger um, out ingredient in its success than anything else. So um, I, I used to call this glove, but then one of the students I was speaking to called it glove, and I, uh, I have no, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I have no confidence in the uh, correct pronunciation of this anymore. Um, but, uh, but either way, it's G-L-O-V-E. And <laughs> uh, so uh, this is basically a, it's an approach motivated by matrix factorization, but in the end they optimize it using uh, SGD type methods so it can still scale up easily. Um, but the motivation is very nice, and the paper is written very well. So if you want to have an intuitive understanding of how to design a training objective, I think this is a very good one. And basically, the, the motivation is um, it's motivated by ratios of uh, word context probabilities. And if we think about ice, and we think about steam, and we think about the motivating or we think about the underlying differences between ice and steam, for example. Um, what, what are the underlying differences between them? And the underlying differences um, are that ice is solid and, um, and steam is gas, right? Uh, so the I whole idea here is that if you look at the probability of like solid, given that ice appears somewhere in the context, and the probability of uh, solid given that steam appears somewhere in the context, they're going to be really similar, right? Um, and might not have a huge effect on the difference between ice and steam. <laughs> similarly, uh, similarly for gas. However, water is going to have a much higher influence, right? Because water appears, you know, um, uh, very closely together uh, with both ice and steam. And then you have fashion, which also doesn't appear very, you know, uh, um, very uh, close together with this. So basically, if you look at the probabilities, something like water becomes much more important. But then if you look at the ratios of the probabilities, you can see that solid uh, becomes very uh, discri discriminative of uh, the difference between these two, and similarly for gas in the other direction. So um, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but there's a nice derivation from the, the start to a final loss function. Um, where they define uh, this kind of uh, w i w j w k uh, thing, which is based on the ratio of the uh, of the probabilities, they make a bunch of assumptions like uh, embedding should be meaningful in linear space, uh, including differences and dot products. So if you take a difference, that should um, be indicative of the difference between words, um, dot products uh, for similarity between words. Um, Word and context invariance. So Glove, uh, Glove is uh, one example of something that, uh, that uses words and context the same. They, they share the parameters between them. And also being robust to low frequency contexts. And they end up with some uh, uh, basically objective that looks like this, where you want to take the dot product between the two, uh, plus a bias, minus a log, um, uh, et cetera, it, uh, squared. And then they take the subjective and they optimize it with uh, stochastic gradient descent. But um, uh, this is also popular. It's one of the common methods uh, that people have used for, uh, for training these embeddings. Um, oh, another, in yeah, sorry, go ahead. To calculate those probabilities, you will take the score or the output of the neural network, right? Uh, to calculate these probabilities, this is a count-based method, actually. So this, is, uh, this has count-based probabilities. Um, so you just count them up and, uh, and divide. Yeah. So glove embeddings are, do not come under this type of um, So as I said, the um, the writing in the book is a little bit vague uh, with respect to this. I would still call glove a distributed representation because it's not a local one-hot vector. Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, so in this case, they use the same vectors for, um, for both uh, words and context words. Um, any other questions? Okay. 
Um, so then the question is, what context should you be using? And context has a really large effect. Um, interestingly, this was um, this was known a long time ago, you know, far before um, before neural embeddings, but it's still equally relevant today. And um, depending on the size of the context that you provide the model, um, you will learn different types of information in the embeddings. Um, and if you give a really small context window, this is likely to give you very syntactic embeddings. And the reason why is because the part of speech of a word, for example, is very heavily influenced by the immediately neighboring words. But it's, if you go even two words away, um, there's going to be a much weaker correlation between the part of speech and the other, um, and the other information. If you have a large context window, you're going to get more semantic-based and topical embedding. So like, let's say you just averaged together everything uh, from everywhere in the document that the, um, uh, that the word appeared. If that's the case, there would be virtually no correlation between syntax because you know, the syntax averaged over the whole document is going to be very similar. Uh, but the topic will come out very clearly, right? So the wider you make it, the more, essentially, the more topic or semantics and the less syntax that you're likely to get. Yeah. So would this result hold across languages? Because something like Russian, where word order is not as important, you might not get as much syntax from just small context windows. So would, uh, would this hold across uh, languages? And um, because, uh, for example, Russian might have freer word order, so this would not be as relevant. And I think that might have an effect, but every language in the world has hierarchical structure. I, I feel like I can probably defend myself against this. There are very few statements that work, uh, that work for every language in the world, but I think this is one of the few ones that does. Um, and because of that, I think there's some sense of locality in the syntax of every language. And, and the semantics, but a greater extent syntax than semantics. However, if you had a very richly morphologically rich language like Russian or, or something else like this, then just looking at the words themselves will lead to sparsity problems and other things. And it's actually probably better to look at the information about the actual characters in the word. And I think I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So, yeah. Any other questions? OK. Um, and also context based on syntax. So this gives you more uh, functional um, words with the same inflection group together. So this would be one way that you could uh, overcome this, maybe in a even more principled way. Um, so evaluating embeddings. Um, let's say we've trained up a whole bunch of embeddings, or we have a bunch of embeddings, and we want to know which ones we should be using. Um, so there's types, different types of evaluation. And this goes for any uh, system uh, that you might want to evaluate. But specifically for pre-training, it becomes particularly important. And uh, intrinsic versus intrinsic. So intrinsic is how good is something based on its underlying features. And extrinsic is how useful is it in a downstream task. Um, there's also qualitative versus quantitative. So qualitative is basically examining the characteristics of individual examples, whereas quantitative is calculating some sort of aggregate statistics. Um, and so visualization of embeddings is uh, one way you can, uh, you can do things. Uh, so you take the embeddings and you turn them into some sort of visual representation of them. Uh, the most common one is to do dimension reduction into two or three uh, dimensions. Um, because uh, about two or three dimensions is a, you know, <laughs> as much as humans can realistically look at and understand. Um, if you want a challenge project, maybe you can try four-dimensional dimension, uh, <laughs> visualization of embeddings where they change in time also, but you'd have to be pretty creative to figure out how to make that work. Um, but So this is an example where you do um, principal component analysis, which is a linear uh, reduction uh, technique uh, to, um, to reduce the embeddings to uh, a lower, uh, lower dimension, two dimensions. And you can see interesting correlations, like you take China and Beijing, uh, Russia and Moscow, Japan and Tokyo, and you can see there's essentially not an exactly sim same vector between them, but there's a pretty similar vector uh, between uh, countries and their capitals. Um, there's also nonlinear uh, projection to. Uh, sorry, go ahead. So, this is a two part question. Yeah. At, at what point uh, is it, would I get a train where there are many stacks for example, on low reality languages where you don't have a defined amount of data? So mm -hmm. at what point is the good idea that I train my own, own more embeddings? The second question is, 
is there a way to transfer word embeddings from a high resource language like English to a low resource language? Is there some sort of transformation or some paper that have worked on such a Yes, so these are these are really good questions. So the first question is, when should I be training my embeddings from scratch? And the answer is, any time you want to work with data that's not the same as the big data that the people who trained the embeddings were using. Um, so even for English, uh, let's say you want to process biomedical text, you're not going to do very well with embeddings that were trained on, uh, you know, on non-biomedical text. Um, a lot of the embeddings are trained on like Wikipedia or something, so if it's something that's very similar to terminology or whatever that was trained on Wikipedia articles, or that's included in Wikipedia articles, you can do pretty well, so that gives you good coverage. But let's say, um, let's say it's legal documents, and you know, really Wikipedia doesn't have a lot of legalese, um, so that would be a problem. If you're doing low resource languages, certainly, you know, um, uh, Wikipedia is very small for a lot of low resource languages, but maybe you can get big data from the common crawl or something like that. Um, or maybe there's data that's not even available on the web, which is the case for a lot of uh, languages. Um, what was the second part? Uh, is, it, is, there, is, there, is there any approaches, are there any approaches to you know, transfer learn from a large, uh, from a huge uh, resource language like English or other languages? So, yeah, are there methods, are there methods to transfer from a high resource language? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the, I'm gonna, I might talk about this a little bit more next time and contextualize embeddings, but th there's essentially two ways. Um, one way is to train, um, to train them individually, uh, train embeddings individually on two languages, and then try to align the embedding spaces between the two languages. Um, this is pretty widely used mainly for convenience purposes because people don't want to retrain embeddings on lower resource languages, but you're still kind of limited by the how good the underlying embedding space is as well. Um, the other way is to train the embeddings jointly on multiple languages, and this is nice because if you train them jointly, you can kind of learn uh, jointly, uh, you know, maybe some of them share conjugations, or maybe some of them share lots of uh, cognates or, or words between them, um, and stuff like this. Uh, so if you train jointly, you're probably going to do a little bit better, a little better job of boosting below resource language, as long as there's significant commonality between the, um, the words. And uh, Aditi, your wonderful TA, has a very nice paper on uh, cross-lingual transfer of embedding, so you can talk to her more about that. Um, so good questions. Uh, any other ones? Okay, um, so also when you do visualization, you can do nonlinear projection. Um, so linear projection is nice, but when there's some sort of underlying nonlinear structure in the data, um, it's very hard to get that out uh, by just reducing to two dimensions. So um, for example, in PCA, um, if you take, uh, this is an example where you do principal <coughs> component analysis, so linear reduction, of um, bit vectors from, not bit vectors, sorry, um, black and white vectors from the MNIST data set, which is a data set of handwritten digits. And you can see that this dimensionality reduction basically reduces them to uh, a thing where kind of, uh, let's see, six and uh, three, I guess, are pretty close together in the space. Um, uh, three and two are kind of like overlapped in the space and stuff like this. And despite the fact that we as humans can tell there's very clear differences between them, uh, the, the, these differences get washed out due to dimensionality reduction. Um, so there are nonlinear methods for dimensionality reduction that basically try to learn a nonlinear mapping so that uh, things that are close together in the high dimensional space end up being close together in the low dimensional space. And things that are uh, far apart in the high dimensional space tend to be uh, far apart in the low dimensional space. And the, um, the representative approach to this is TISNI. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go through the technical details of that, and we have a, a script that allows you to do that. Um, one thing to be aware is the advantage of um, low dimensional, um, of linear reduction is that any linear correlation in the high dimensional space will also be a linear correlation in the low dimensional space. Um, however, that's not the case for nonlinear reduction, and you can see that 
you take an original space, this is an original two-dimensional space, you run it through this Tisney algorithm that a lot of people use, and um, depending on the hyperparameters of the Tisney algorithm, it could become this or this or this or this or this. Um, so, uh, also linear correlations cannot be interpreted. So this is the original space, um, and it can turn into something like this or this. It can even turn into DNA if you really want it to. Um, and uh, so uh, there, there's that. This is a very nice like visual paper uh, on, uh, on distill.pub that uh, allows you to um, take a look at this. So um, one caution, if you're doing nonlinear dimensionality reduction, you should not be drawing these lines on your graphs. Uh, it, you know, it kind of seems maybe obvious in hindsight, but if you're doing Tisney, you shouldn't be like looking for linear correlations uh, in vector space like this. Um, so intrinsic evaluation of embeddings. So all of this up until that was qualitative analysis of embeddings. It wasn't um, uh, quantitative in any way. We're just looking at them and taking a look. Um, there's also intrinsic evaluation methods for embeddings. Um, and there's a bunch of different uh, strategies to do so. Um, one is relatedness. So the way is you ask humans to evaluate how similar words are, and then you try to find similarity in embedding space being similarity to um, uh, in, a word, uh, in word space. So you just ask humans how similar do you think these are, and you hope that your vector similarity will uh, correlate with that. Um, another one is solving analogy problems. So this is like taking the SAT test if you've ever taken a, like an American entrance exam. Uh, but uh, so find A is to B and X is to Y. Uh, um, also categorization. So you create clusters based on the embeddings and measure purity of the clusters. Um, the selectional preference thing is something that's listed in this paper, but it's pretty minor. So uh, I won't go into that in detail. Um, so the intrinsic evaluation is nice because it's very straightforward and it's not reliant on any downstream system. But however, what we really care about most of the time is how well do these things work in downstream systems anyway. So um, the extrinsic evaluation, basically, um, you put it into a system, and then you e either initialize the system with the embeddings, uh, concatenate pre-trained embeddings with learned embeddings, um, uh, et cetera, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and then use them in the system. So yeah, like these are just two ways of doing it. The latter is more expressive, but leads to an increase in model parameters. One thing I should mention is if you're using um, pre-trained embeddings, you always need to decide whether to freeze them or to train them together with the model. Um, they both have advantages and disadvantages, which is freezing will um, probably lead to better generalization to models that aren't in your supervised training data. Um, but if you, uh, um, if you, uh, you lose expressivity, so it's kind of hard to see and say which one is uh, going to be better. So um, then the question is, how do you choose embeddings? So uh, the Schnabel et al. paper is very nice. It, it analyzes a whole bunch of uh, different embeddings on different aspects um, uh, and basically finds that for um, intrinsic evaluation tasks, these, uh, the SIBO embeddings from word to vec were pretty good for the ones at the time. However, if you try them in downstream tasks like um, F1, uh, like chunking, uh, which is a syntactic task, then completely different embeddings that looked really bad at these you know, relatedness tasks are actually better. So long story short, um, it's probably going to vary. So uh, you know, if anybody has already evaluated this for you, then you can look at their paper and follow the one that worked well for tasks that look like your task. If not, then you might have to do it yourself. Um, so yeah, be aware and use the best way for the test. And finally, um, when would we expect pre-trained embeddings to be useful? And basically, um, pre-trained embeddings are a method to transfer information from unlabeled data to labeled, uh, labeling tasks. And so they're very useful for the things like tagging, parsing, text classification, etc. Um, they're less useful for something like machine translation um, because machine translation, there's lots of naturally occurring data um, in many cases. So uh, you might not have to use some sort of 
uh, unsupervised embedding method, uh, although it can help in some cases. And then if you're doing language modeling, the amount of data you have to train your embeddings is exactly the same amount of data you have for language modeling, so why bother? Just you know, train a language model. Um, it might make convergence faster or something like that, but um, uh, there's that. OK, are there any questions about this? Uh, so I will move to the um, the next part. So I'm, I'm going to quickly go for the last uh, 15 minutes or so uh, through methods for improving embeddings. And um, I'm not going to talk about contextualization of embeddings, as I said, because I'm going to talk about that next time. But nonetheless, a lot of the uh, the problems that I'm going to talk about here uh, also you know, are things that are important to think about um, uh, for the next class as well. So um, one is that they're sensitive to superficial differences or differences that are based on, you know, like single character differences that don't relate to the semantics. Um, so if you just look things up in a matrix and the matrix for dog and dogs are different, then, you know, um, if you don't have lots of training data for dogs, you'll be out of luck. Um, they're also not necessarily correlated with knowledge or across languages. So um, uh, this is a problem. And also, uh, in some cases, they can be not very interpretable. Um, and also, they can encode bias, uh, like stereotypical gender roles, racial biases, et cetera. Um, so um, one really uh, powerful tool that is used in many modern models for learning embeddings is uh, subword embeddings. And there are a couple, like, I put these two papers up here um, because these were kind of the original methods that people used for training subword embeddings. And the first one is kind of a very linguistically motivated one where you do some analysis of the embedding and you split it into different morphemes, which are kind of the underlying units of the word. And you have embeddings for each morpheme and then you compute them, you combine them in a tree structured fashion uh, to uh, try to get them uh, to get the final embedding. Um, the next one is uh, you can also just run a recurrent neural network in either direction and try to calculate uh, the embedding from the last state. Um, but now what most people have uh, settled on uh, is a method for uh, capturing word embeddings uh, using subword information is this bag of character engrams. And the basic idea is um, you have uh, where, uh, like the word where, and you split it up into a whole bunch of character engrams, so like WH, WHE, HER, uh, ERE, RE. Uh, maybe you have three and four and five. And um, yeah, three, four, five, six. Uh, you, for high frequency words, you also have an embedding for the word itself. And um, you just sum together all of these embeddings and use them to, uh, to calculate uh, the um, uh, the, the embedding for the whole word. And the reason why this is good is like, let's say we have dog and dogs, right? They'll both contain the engram DOG. Um, and also lots of other embeddings will, uh, lots of other words will contain the engram maybe S end of sentence, for example. And S end, uh, sorry, S end of word. And S end of word is very indicative of plural, right? So you have one embedding representing DOG, which represents the semantics. You have one embedding representing S end of word, uh, which represents the syntax. You sum them together, and now we have our nice, you know, syn syntacto syntactic, syntacto semantic embedding. That's not a natural word, but um, uh, yeah. So. Doesn't this uh, greatly expand the uh, vocab size? Doesn't this greatly expand the vocab size? So this is a good question. Um, yes and no. Uh, the reason why it, it, the answer is yes is because there are many more character engrams uh, than there are words. The answer why it's no is because previously you had to memorize every single word you've seen in the training data, otherwise it would be out of vocabulary and you couldn't use it at all. So now you can actually threshold uh, vocabulary, th threshold the number of things that you actually remember word embeddings for, and that makes it, uh, it is a very effective way to reduce vocabulary. So um, yeah, good question though. Any other questions? So another thing I should point out is that the, um, the fast text toolkit, which is used pretty widely, also uses this method. Um, another advantage you get from this is even if you've never seen the word before in your vocabulary, you can still calculate the, the embedding of an unknown word 
uh, purely from its uh, engrams, which is very useful in case uh, your teacher invents a word like syntactic, syntacto semantic, uh, and you need uh, embedding for it. So. What would be the context? So um, I'm pretty certain, but not 100% certain, that they only did this for the word embedding itself. And then the context is just um, regular words. And they also threshold that with the vocabulary. Um, I'm not 100% certain about that, but I'm pretty pretty sure. Yeah. Um, any good question, though? Any others? OK. So this is something you definitely should know. Um, I've done a pretty thorough empirical investigation of a whole bunch of different ways to take character embeddings and turn them into a word embedding, including this, including CNNs, including by LSTMs. Um, and this is like way better and converges quite a bit faster. So I think there's a reason why this is used in fast text. Um, so it's a good, a good technique to have in your uh, technique repository. Um, that, uh, what I just said was with respect to machine translation. But you know, there's, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's for other tasks as well. Um, so another thing, I've actually already talked about this, so I'll just get back, I'll just mention it briefly. So a multilingual coordination of embeddings. One thing that you can do is um, you can uh, train embeddings in uh, multiple languages and then post hoc uh, try to learn a transform over them uh, that, uh, that turns them into embeddings in the same language. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, uh, the most standard way, uh, actually this figure is a little bit um, harder to follow uh, because it's using two transformation matrices, but like, let's say you have, um, uh, let's just call the ones in one language x uh, source and um, the ones in the target language x target and you try to do a, a transformation you try to learn a transformation matrix W uh, so that X source um, becomes similar to X target uh, according to some notion of similarity. Um, and the, uh, in order to do this, you need to have basically aligned words um, in the source and target languages. And you can use this by just having a dictionary, for example. Um, there's also methods that induce this dictionary in an unsupervised fashion. Um, which I don't think, uh, oh yes, which I'm talking about here. So basically the way this works is, um, oh, one thing that you can do, which I think is actually pretty clever, is just take all the digits and say uh, digits are the same in many, many languages in the world, so you just map them together. Or just take other identical words, um, all the identical words. So like even if you train word embeddings on Chinese Wikipedia, there's a bunch of English words um, included in Chinese Wikipedia, so these words can then anchor the embeddings together. Like dog and cat will tend to appear in um, animal related topics. Um, gun and violence will tend to appear in crime related topics. And in a way, kind of like clusters of words tend to um, be consistent across the languages. So you can even do un kind of unsupervised distribution matching uh, to get this to work. And you can also take into account information about how frequent words are. So, like if kitten and cat. Um, are of a certain frequency, and then uh, the Chinese equivalent of them uh, is uh, like equal to the, you know, of a certain frequency, then things of similar frequency are, are more likely to be mapped together. So there's a bunch of distributional cues that you can use uh, to do uh, this completely unsupervised as well. 
Okay, so another thing is um, retrofitting embeddings to existing lexicons. So um, if we have an, a lexicon like WordNet, um, this tells us which words are, can be synonyms of each other. So basically what we do is we, um, uh, we come up with an objective where the objective basically tells us, um, uh, I would like our embeddings to be similar to the original embeddings that I got. So we've, sorry, we pre-trained embeddings using something like word to vec And then we essentially fine tune the embeddings to try to get them to match with our um, semantic lexicons. And so what you do is you say, I want to be similar to the original embeddings, which is kind of our alpha term on the left side. And we also want embeddings that are marked as synonyms in this lexicon to be similar with each other. Um, so then you, uh, you also have a term that says, okay, if these are synonyms, I'd like these to be similar uh, in the embedding space. And this actually uh, is uh, a pretty interesting way to use existing resources to fine tune uh, things and still uh, maintain the underlying space. Okay, um, an another thing is uh, sparse embeddings. So each dimension of a, a word embedding itself is not necessarily interpretable. Um, however, there's a very easy way to make each embedding somewhat interpretable, and that's by making each, uh, um, each dimension of the embedding sparse. So the basic idea is um, normally uh, fully distributed representations, each um, uh, element is a non-zero uh, float. But what you do is you add a constraint that tries to make um, most of the elements zero and only a few elements positive. Um, positive usually also. So uh, this uses something like um, non-negative sparse matrix factorization um, to essentially uh, make the elements positive and sparse. And because of this, if they have to be positive, the existence of an element gives you additional information about the word, right? It's not like trying to subtract away anything. Um, also existence of the element um, you only can have a couple elements, so each of the elements is more likely to be something that's kind of human interpretable. And to give some actual empirical results, um, if you look at the top five words per dimension in uh, an SVD-based embedding, this is account-based embedding, but SVD-based embedding, you have well, long, if your watch, plan, engine, e, rock, vary. So these aren't very, you know, interpretable. Um, but if you do it in the non-negative uh, non sparse embedding, you get inhibitor, inhibitors, antagonists, receptors, inhibition, uh, Bristol, Thames, uh, Southampton, Brighton, Pool. So you, you don't even get a city uh, dimension. You get a British city dimension and then an Indian city dimension, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, so yeah, there's that. <clears throat> and um, finally, um, one uh, major problem with kind of NLP in general, but also uh, word embeddings in particular, is that um, models trained on biased data can result in existing biases, so uh, being reflected in our models. So um, one example of um, things that were uh, um, occupations and got uh, embeddings that were closest in the, so you create a vector that's basically the vector between he and she. And um, you, uh, then you take all of the vectors that are occupations and closest to the she direction and the occupations in a, are closest to the he direction, and you can see it's very, uh, you know, essentially encoding existing stereotypes about like what genders are doing uh, particular occupations. And this is certainly a problem if you want to build a system that like, for example, is recommending jobs to people uh, based on personality traits or something like this, because like, you know, there's plenty of you know, female computer scientists in the room, and I'm sure if you went over to the nursing school and uh, pit, there'd be plenty of male people there. So um, combined with uh, the pr fact that um, systems tend to over predict, tend to amplify existing uh, disparities in the data, this is a really big problem uh, society-wise if you want to be fair uh, to people. So um, 
Uh, there are a bunch of methods that basically identify pairs to neutralize and find the direction of the trait that you would like to neutralize and ensure they're neutral in that direction. There's also some interesting um, work that shows that even doing this isn't sufficient to kind of remove all the information that you would like to remove um, and you need to think in a more holistic way. I think I'll probably talk about this a little bit more in the interpretability uh, section or something like that as well. Um, another thing is it's not just gender. Um, there's this paper by um, uh, Dan Jarevsky's group, I forget who the first author is, that's pretty terrifying, which uh, trains word embeddings on e text from each segment in American history. And it demonstrates very clearly the really horrible racial stereotypes that existed during that segment in, uh, uh, in American history. And fortunately now, maybe it's a little bit better than it was before, but um, this is something you need to be really, really uh, aware of when you're training models. So I think this is a good research to uh, be aware of. Um, I'm going to skip this. I already talked about fast text, but you can look at the slides if you'd like. Um, so that's all. And I'm happy to take questions uh, offline afterwards.